So he volunteered because his, his family was engulfed in the war too. They were already drafted. Why not get involved as well? How are you feeling? How much more time do you need before we can kind of talk about examples? Oh, I can work. I can do this job. Yeah, Zach. And then let me know if you need anything else, okay? And that's where I want to, in relation to our previous discussions, I want you all to understand how I situate myself and my perspective and my bias and background, is that I was drawn to the study of history because of World War II. My teaching philosophy really focuses on engaged student learning and also diversity and really trying to teach students that they can be bridges who connect diverse peoples and communities and to emphasize their strengths, their backgrounds, their perspectives, to refine their ability as a historian and as a scholar and learner. I don't want to call them students. I want to see them as learners and as potential scholars and public intellectuals. But that's a part of their identity? Yes. OK. So even though they're labeled as Japanese or affiliated with it, they are still showing they're American. American. Yeah. And that's what they prioritize. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. And then what about for code talkers? What identity is mm -hmm. on the line for them? Well, obviously, Navajo is a native to mm -hmm. the United, uh, United States. Mm -hmm. That's where they were born, where they came from. So they want to show, I said, the heritage and like defend, use, use their language to get the United mm -hmm. States out of trouble. With so maybe a concept to add to identity is heritage, exactly, right? Yeah. That that's kind of inseparable in some ways to put with that. We all learn differently. We all have different goals. We all have different backgrounds and personal experiences that really constitute who we are. And I don't want to take away from that. I want to add to it. I want to refine who they are and let them be empowered and let them fulfill their potential as they want to direct it and see it. I have a perspective that is valuable from my diverse background as a Native American scholar and historian, as someone of mixed ancestry. I think my experiences can really help them, people in whatever situation they are in their lives, whatever learning backgrounds they have. And I want them to trust me and to build a relationship with me as a guide and a learner that we learn together. I want them to recognize this is reciprocal. They are teaching me because I can never know exactly how they learn until we work on a relationship together. I'm willing to adapt and to learn from them. And I want them to understand that the students in my classroom, the learners I meet, and different peoples I meet in communities across the world. Ask yourselves, are there common reasons between these diverse cases that we're looking at of why they would volunteer? Do they share any similar reasons? So I think that's something to pay attention to with that first question. I know that there are a variety of courses I could be qualified and very passionate about teaching. If I could choose to teach any course that I wanted, so I have to come down to saying two classes, actually, that I would love to teach and develop the curriculum and the coursework for. And one of those is actually a general class that I want to emphasize US history from the perspective of war. War is often a huge marker of change and historical transformation. And I really wanted to just embrace that issue going from the American Revolution, or even before then, with colonial conflicts and encounters between colonists and colonizers and settlements with Native American indigenous groups, all the way to the present concerns about wars in the Middle East and the United States involvement in that. I want students to really take a general survey class that most students are required to take, but focus on the issue of war and how it affects everyone in different ways, indirectly and directly, even to this day, to the students in my classroom. And I've already played with example, uh, examples of books that I would assign, including some books that I think bring in some fictional stories of war. Like even the Hunger Games, these popular readings that bring in issues of war, but they take from histories of the past. 
And I want students to really talk about this and see how in popular culture, we have a lot of history appropriated and mixed in with these stories and the possibilities of just future catastrophes and war and how it's a fear and affects our emotion. But how do human beings cope with that? How do they deal with that? And a part of asking him about his, his experiences in World War II is he began his story by saying he went to boarding school where they told him he could not use his language. And he was punished for using Navajo at all. And he was told that. So what he did, what he told me he did, is he went out in the playground and he'd play with sticks and rocks or whatever he could. And he would talk to the sticks and rocks in Navajo. And he told me that's how he kept the language alive for him. That's how he did not forget his language, is he would talk to toys, essentially. And then when I learned that he volunteered when he was 16, he lied about his age so that he could serve in the military, he volunteered. And he, I think he said he like drank a lot of water so that he'd be heavy enough. Can you imagine you're 16? What were you doing when you were 16? And he signed up to be a Marine, a US Marine. And he went through the training and passed the training to be a code talker. And I asked him later, as I was reflecting back on this history, it dawned on me, wait a second, Uncle Albert, I asked him. I said, why would you ever volunteer to serve in the US military and use your language, the Navajo language, that the US government wanted to eradicate, that they wanted to erase? There are so many different Americans from diverse backgrounds. And when you pose this question, it can mean something very different to every American of why they decided to volunteer during World War II. And we already talked about how World War II united Americans on many levels on the home front and abroad, but there were also huge tensions that erupted with the racial-based riots in Detroit and Los Angeles that we talked about last week. I want to pass around here some of my show and tell and relate this back to our service learning project with the Phoenix Indian School Legacy Project, right? Is that you read Turner and you learned about how the boarding school was designed very discipline focused and with a military style, right? Well, some people say that was a benefit of the boarding school, that they were prepared to go serve in the military and serve their country because of their boarding school experience. So that's something to think about as you're looking at these oral histories and preparing your exhibit designs for the historical gallery, right? Another class I would love to teach is focusing on educational and learning experiences of American youth in diverse backgrounds, focusing on terms of race, class, and gender. I would have a section about how Native Americans were introduced to institutional, institutionalized education, such as the boarding schools and some other programs, like the Latter-day Saint placement program. But I also would focus on the issues of segregation and busing with African American experiences in education. Or we could look at Mexican Americans and, and their experiences learning with immigration playing into that and discussions about um, how education is a right and a privilege for everyone and those issues. Or we could talk about Japanese attorneys and how they were receiving their school lessons. So I really want this diverse picture and narrative taking these different student experiences and tracing it as a class together to understand how educational institutions have changed in the United States history, how they vary, and how the experiences are so diverse. And yet, the questions go back to who controls education? Who controls the education of our youth? These are vital questions that are still struggles today, politically and historically, and will not end. The Densho, which talk about the Nisei, that's a second generation Japanese uh, who live in the United States. They're American citizens. And that provides primary sources to look at their experience during World War II, particularly with the internment camps and the relocation centers. 
And the Japanese American internment primary sources is from the Library of Congress. So that's another area for you to look at. And then there's National Archive primary sources on the Navajo Code Talkers. And you guys can even look at some of my share and tell stuff. Those are considered primary sources because they include photographs and interviews, oral histories of the code talkers, OK? But I want you, again, look at those questions. They're all basically a reiteration of this question and refer to these primary sources. I want you to use you know, whatever electronic device you have with internet access to specify evidence from primary sources. And you can refer to secondary sources, too. But focus on the primary sources to answer the question and contextualize your answer. My research has influenced my teaching immensely. I am very comfortable in my skin. I am who I am. And many people question who I am, and they question my identity. I identify as a Navajo woman, as a Navajo woman of mixed ancestry. I have Anglo-American in my lineage, and I also have Jewish American lineage as well, Jewish German. And all these mixes come in, and I'm Navajo. And this is a bit complicated because Navajos have a strong identity as a community. And there is a Navajo reservation where many Navajos live together. I was born on the Navajo reservation, but I was raised in a very diverse place, the Washington, DC metropolitan area. My best friends were from Cameroon. They were from India, or they were from China, or they were second generation Chinese Americans. They were so diverse. I met people from Europe, from Africa, diplomats, children. And this influenced who I, who I am and it influenced my research interests because I started to ask, why do my friends from Cameroon speak French so well? They speak French, but they do not speak an African language. And I started to ask, why is my father Native American? What does that mean? Why is he Navajo? Who is my Navajo family? And I lived very far from my Navajo family for most of my life. And then I started to learn that two of my uncles were Navajo co code talkers. Who were the Navajo code talkers? Why are they revered? Why are the Navajo code talkers revered historically? Or why do other people not know about them? And I know about them. So this started to direct me in my research towards colonial studies, towards studies of power dynamics, trying to understand what happened with, America, with colonialism in the United States and relationships between Euro-Americans and Native Americans and wondering what happened to them. And then also asking, well, what, what happened in Africa? Why do Africans know English? Why do they, they know French? And it, it was also my passion of languages, understanding different cultures and peoples, that I started to study Portuguese. I started to study Yoruba, a language spoken in Nigeria. And I started to study Navajo, the language that my father spoke, but I never learned because my mother is only English speaking. And so this started to, the language studies started to guide me in my research as well, because language is, it is like a library of knowledge and history. Language is how mindsets work, and that's how we, we think. And so these emphases have directed my research, and then I cannot deny how they influence my teaching. I do bring up issues of Native American history in all my classes because I think it relates on so many levels. You cannot just compartmentalize Native American history. It is a central vein. And so many of these American experiences, although they are so different, although they are so diverse, they intertwine. They are in interconnected. We are all Americans, even though we may not like each other and have not treated each other how we should treat each other. But we are Americans, and this affects our history. And so this comes into my teaching. As I, I teach a class that has students from all kinds of backgrounds, and I really try to be a guide by emphasizing, yes, I have my own values, and being very transparent about my background and how it affects my research, because that research is my focus. I've, 
I've really focused on things that I value and see as relevant to my personal story and my background. And so I want to share that with my students in the class. We do not know as human beings everything in the world, and we can never know the history perfectly. But we're on a shared journey of understanding the past together. And we can never perfectly reconstruct the past. And our biases will always affect how we look at sources, how we look at evidence, and how we look at the past, and how we judge the past, even though we are striving to contextualize and to understand why historical figures acted the way they did. And another part of that is I really emphasize service learning in the classroom and engaged student learning. And some students are confused by that because they're used to traditional history classes where an instructor comes up and lectures. But I really see the classroom as an, an environment where reciprocal relationships grow between the teacher and the learner, that the teacher cannot deny that they are a learner. And so I want to be open with my students, let them understand who I am and how that influences my perspective as a researcher and as a teacher. And I hope that they can learn something from me. I know they can because I have a very different background than many people being Navajo and raised in the DC area. But I also respect their backgrounds. I know I can learn from them and we can have a conversation together where we learn together. <laughs>